Live from the Export Beer Garden Studios, you're listening to the BYC. On today's podcast, we'll be focusing on the second test versus Bangladesh, where our very own Paul Ford predicted it perfectly. A squeaky bum victory with six wickets down. The only thing he got wrong was predicting it would be Kane Williamson and Santner to bring us home. Instead, it was the indefinable Phillips and Santner who combined beautifully to take us over the line. We'll also have a game at the new look New Zealand one day squad with some new names chucked in the mix to spice and things up a little and Dylan Cleaver how's things mate yeah very good feeling a little bit better than this time last week yeah she was squeaky bum though wasn't she I thought we pissed her actually oh here we go <laughs> I tell you I mean I need to let the listeners know and and you can back me up on this Paul Ford Cleaver in the, in our WhatsApp chat uh, chat is an absolute shocker. Talk about commentators curse dropped every second line. It's an atrocity, mate. Yeah, the old um, who did I think would get us home? Devin Conway. Yeah, yeah, seventy five not out was your quote, <laughs> if I remember <laughs> right. rightly. Said yeah, he was yeah. bloody lucky to get Prime, two. <laughs> primed for a big one. Is what you said. Primed for a big one. Yeah, yeah. Body language is looking good now. Speaking of shockers, that pitch, uh, Dylan, not great. I mean. From day one, really. Uh, but w- I don't know. Was it really that bad? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Yeah, I think Tim Southey's well within his rights to come out and slam that pitch, which officially has been slammed today too with kind of curious wording by the ICC who said it was unsatisfactory and noted that the ball was going through the top from ball one. The only reason they didn't absolutely castigate it was because there had been a lot of rain and you could tell that in the outfield. So... Probably the preparation opportunities weren't great, but even still, you don't mind going to the subcontinent and playing on turning wickets that break up as the test goes on. Sure. You know that's what you're going to get. Just like when you go to New Zealand, you know you're going to get a green top on the first morning. Pointless complaining about that. What you can complain about is the pitch not being flat. And, gee, is that over that Devon Conway who was primed for a big one, I should add, uh, got yeah. in that second dig when facing Shoreful, who's a handy but hardly life-threatening bowler. That was insane. Like, he propped forward, the ball whizzed past his nose, then he was too nervous to go forward, so he'd stay on his crease, he'd get cut in half, and eventually he got out to one that skidded low. You can't actually play proper cricket on those sort of wickets. I could. Um, just on that, um, Paul Ford, uh, to quote Tim Southey directly, uh, he says, probably the worst wicket I've come across. Is that yeah, racist? But, um, I don't know. I don't, think it's, I don't think it's racist. It maybe could have been if uh, the match referee, David Boone, the 5'2 Tasmanian with the flare pants, hadn't come out and backed him up 100%. I mean, 177 overs. Um, it means probably not the absolute worst of all time. Um, lots and lots of spinning wick, spinners' wickets, 30 out of 35, I believe. Um Look, I, I think it was just a it was just a terrible pitch, and, and as Dylan mentioned, Bo- Boone's comments were pretty funny because he said um, the bounce was inconsistent from the first session onwards, i.e., the entire match. Um, dot dot dot. The outfield was good. Um, it did appear the pitch may have been underprepared, given it was covered in grass clippings on day one. I mean, this is it, it's just not great when when deliveries are going over your shoulder and then hitting your shoelaces, it's pretty bloody difficult and uh, a rightly deserved demerit point, which they will carry for the next five years. Um, if they get six demerits, then they have no games for 12 months. So uh, Merpur on notice. Yes, indeed. Now, we've got some correspondence from David O, fellas. Great for a win for New Zealand to level the Test Series. I'm looking forward to you all dissecting Mushfika Rahim's inexplicable dismissal in the first innings and the fact he nearly did it half an hour earlier. Has to be one of the most bizarre episodes I've seen in a Test match and from an experienced player who was otherwise looking calm and composed at the crease. Inexplicable, says he. Was weird. Yeah, it was, it was totally weird. And there was no danger of it hitting the stumps. No, and... When he tried, or when he kind of tried that half hour earlier, as um, David O mentions, people were kind of laughing at him, which should have given him a little bit of a clue that, hey. What are you doing? What am I doing? Yes. But there's one tiny little wrinkle in that whole scenario in that, you know how there was all that controversy around the Johnny Bairstow dismissal? And one of the arguments used 
as to why Australia kind of broke the contraventions or the unwritten rules was he was not trying to get any advantage at all. Was Mushfika actually trying to get any advantage? Was he protecting his stumps or was he just pushing the ball away? It's a, it was a weird one. Yeah, like he's a, out. He is out now. Lack of intent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Of, I am yeah, not. Yeah. I'm not saying that he was. It was a poor decision or anything. Like he's dead set out. You can't do that. But was there a was there scope for Rod Tucker or Paul Rifle or even our very own um, skipper Tim Southey to say, mate, that's that's not in the rules. You can't do that. Mm. I don't know. Just putting it out there. Dear, yeah, what do you think, Paul? Yeah, look, it's a it's a tricky one because I think you, it's a hard one to draw a line on, right? So so you can use your glove if there's sort of not a threat to your wicket, but sometimes there is, and you might think there is, and I might think there isn't. It feels pretty subjective. So the rule's pretty blanket. Um, look, yeah, I know you're not saying that it shouldn't have been given not out, but yeah, there is an element of the, the spirit of cricket that could have been invoked there perhaps with the lack of intent. Um, it, w- it was it was very strange, but... Mushfika Rahim does have this procliv- proclivity that lots of batsmen seem to have, and I guess it's born of the fact that there's kind of, particularly when you play New Zealand, there's quite a nice vibe. So you probably do pick the ball up from time to time when it's sort of noodling around, um, you know, y- your feet and just chuck it to the close in fielder. And I wonder if it was just almost like he instinctively did it because he he's picked the ball up a few times. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a it was a very strange situation. Yeah. Uh, it was unfortunate because, and, and you know, uh, the correspondent is right when he says he looked comfortable. Yeah. He, he was probably the most composed and comfortable of all the batsmen at that stage. Uh, easily, easily. Now, let's move. I was just going to say, Jace, the yes. other slightly, the other weird thing about this is he was the first Bangladeshi to be involved in a dismissal um, like this. No New Zealander. Sorry, this is the first time New Zealand has been on either side of one of these weird obstructing the field, handled the ball, retired out, all of these weird dismissals. We've never been involved in one either. So uh, another box ticked for cricket nerds like me. Yes. Now, our next subject is something we had a little bit of a chat about on our WhatsApp, the enigma that is Glenn Phillips. And, you know, I I, I was straight out. I, I don't see him as a test player, but as performances have made me actually take that back a little bit. And I and I put a question to you guys in the chat, which was, given where he bats in the uh, batting order, is he seen as a bowler who bats or a batsman who bowls? As he's way down the order, uh, you were suggesting that he's a bit of a rogue element, that he's yeah. a spark plug, that he is... An agent of chaos. An agent of chaos, indeed. Yeah. And, and actually, I think... That's how I kind of have to define him in my head because I'm not sure, you know, I'm not denying his excellent performances. I'm just not sure where he sits in the side. Yeah, well, look at it. Three for 31. Yes. 87 and a, four, and a match winning 40 not out. And this isn't a test where the scores were 172, 144, 180 and 139 for six. So, for sure. So he is the key figure by a country mile in that game. Yes. Mushvika might have been if he hadn't succumbed Whack, yeah. to stupidity. But... It was the G. Phillips show, as we've got in our headline there. Yeah, it's – and Paul sort of came back on that – what's that chap again, giving um, sort of a peek behind the veil here and said that it's – he has to be defined somehow because Gary Stead is not an agent of chaos type of coach. <laughs> yeah, which I think is an equally fair and good point. He needs categories. Yes. And so I think if you're going to if you're gonna insist, I would say that he is a better – who can be used as a bowler in uh, helpful conditions. But that doesn't quite define it, does it? It doesn't but, quite do the job. But if he's a batter, um, Paul Ford, he's shouldn't, low, he, isn't he? Yeah, shouldn't he be batting above yeah. Blundell? I, I think that's right. I, I, well, he could I, be now. I, I agree. I think it could pl- a player, for a, in our universe, a player can be two things at once. He can be a spark cl- plug, plug, an agent of chaos, a batter who bowls a bit, a bowler who bats a bit, but not in Gary Stead's world. That's not how Gary Stead operates. For Gary Stead, this guy is in the team because Michael Bracewell is injured and we need someone who can bowl some spin and add a little bit of steel to that middle order, uh, to that to that lower order, lower to, you know, to bat with the lower order is what I'm trying to say. And, and I think that's why he's being picked. Now, he's massively over-exceeded with the bowling. I mean, he just seems to find it quite easy. He bowls a, some 
shit house balls that get wickets. But yeah, when you're averaging 16 uh, and with your Test match bowling uh, against your your first class record of 37, and his batting average of 46.6 is above his first-class betting average. This is a guy that just finds test cricket relatively easy. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I do find, and I mean, maybe it's just a, a new breed of test player, you know, um, that the sort of... Hybrid. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm loathe to say bits and pieces type players, as he's better than that. Schrodinger's cat of a cricketer, maybe. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Now, one of the things uh, when when the uh, second test aside was named... Uh, we were all surprised by Santner because yes. we said, actually, did we even mention Sat Santner in our podcast? And I do, I don't believe that we did, um, Dylan. Now we went through a lot of permutations about how we were going to crowbar Ratchin- R- R- Ratchin- Ravindra in there, Ravindra but, Ravindra but not Santner. And not Santner, no. <laughs> Inspired selection, as it turned out. Yeah, well, who, who subsequently had an excellent game. Yeah, three for 65. He failed in the first egg with one. Then three for 51, and obviously he was uh, the man beside Phillips. To, to and car- car- yeah, career, that six for 116 that you mentioned, Dylan, his best ever in, in Test cricket, and that fourth innings um, coming out to bat at number eight, 69 for six, and all of the top order batting is gone. So we're dead. Um, I was backing him to the hilt, but it was hope rather than kind of expectation, or, you know, hope rather than really absolute belief. Um, in those conditions, there were chances. But, um, you know, he, he did superbly well. And Phillips talked about his approach, um, which was to, you know, get leg side and fast hands and all that stuff. And Santner, you could see Santner basically going, oh, yeah, that works for me. I'll try that as well. Magnificent. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and you know, I, I imagine a, a fellow like Santner too is itching to get back into that side. And so he's probably going to grab the opportunity with both hands because his, his second innings, Dick, was, was a good knock yeah, so uh, under a lot of pressure. So I wonder if we've now got this kind of um, backlog of Asian-only chess players. Yes. You know, uh, <laughs> because um, we haven't mentioned Ajaz Patel, but yes, two, wow. two for 54, six for 57, so, which puts him in the firing line to be dropped. Obviously. Yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, they, they, they have to drop him now, don't they, Paul? <laughs> to be completely on brand. I mean, what's our next test match is South Africa on the 1st oh, in February, February, I think. Um, yeah. You know, and yeah, you just would expect it'll be green and seeming, and it'll be Bolt, Southey, Wagner, Jamison, um, insert bowler who was injured or unavailable for that test series, but four seamers. Um, and then if you're going get to get a spinner in there, yeah, it's going to be difficult to look past the likes of Phillips, Bracewell, Santner, um, Ravindra, and find a place for Ajaz. Really bloody difficult, and uh, possibly Phillips' success over in Asia, it adds another nail to the Ajaz Patel playing in home test matches coffin. Uh, and the controversy continues, Re Nichols. Uh, what were the scores there, fellas? 19, 2, 1 and 3. Yeah, but um, he got backing. He got the full backing of the chairman of selectors. Yes. Uh, did you, um, I don't know if you saw the comments, but yeah, it was a, it was a multi-pronged defence of uh, Nichols whilst throwing a former great an elegant left-hander under the bus, basically saying that the only reason Nichols is looking bad at the moment is because he's playing in an era of greats, which is a strange take to, to I guess, but, yeah, you know, oh, I guess there's some merit to it. And pointing out that his nine test centuries are as many as Stephen Fleming got in 111 tests, which is also correct. But, but he also got about a million fifties, Fleming. Yeah, and the thing that annoys me about that argument is no one's disputing that Nichols is not an effective compiler of centuries in New Zealand conditions in particular. He, and, and at times, Nichols has been a really, really, really good player for New Zealand. Yes. But the only question that Sam Wells has to answer is, is he holding out someone from the team who is better than him at the moment? And I think most of us would agree that, well, yeah, he is. Paul? Paul? Yeah, well, I mean, the numbers don't lie in a in a career that goes for seven years. And the, the the fact is, in his last 24 bats for New Zealand over the last two years, he's scored 200s and 150, and he's averaged about 28. So 
if you're going to play in that New Zealand top order, it doesn't really matter if you're in the pantheon of greats over, you know, the last seven or eight years. It's how are you playing at the moment? And can we just have a little look at the numbers and go, probably not that well. Is it worth giving someone else a crack? That's kind of, you know, it's not like we're just talking about a guy that's had one bad score. This is starting to look like a bit of a long-term problem, actually. Yeah. Yeah, interesting one. Well, you know, for me, it's just a straight swap. Get an old Ratchin. He's the future. So, you know, here he nips on your way, mate. Yeah, I just think there's a feeling out there now, and I think it's permeated all sort of levels of cricket in New Zealand, from fans to fellow players. I know there's frustration of the first-class scene that he almost feels like a protected species, and that's probably not fair on him. He doesn't pick the team. Gary yeah. Stead and Sam Wells does, but... Yeah, it feels like there's nothing he can do <laughs> to be usurped by a Will Young or a Ratchin Ravindra or probably any Tom Bruce, any number of players that would be just crying out for a third of the opportunities sure. that Nichols has Now, served. Bangladesh, of course, coming to New Zealand, the first one day on Sunday, some new names uh, added there, Paul Ford. And it's funny, eh, because we've been talking about new blood quite a lot on the podcast uh, first and foremost, what are your thoughts on the new boys? Any surprises there for you? Oh, I think it's nice to see Josh Clarkson get a go. I'm intrigued about Willow Rook. I know his old man was a pretty ferocious competitor, so interested to see how how he goes on the international scene. He's another big rig in the Henry Shipley mould. And of course, uh, games two and three, we've got Eddie Ashok. He'll be he'll be um, lovely to watch. Hopefully, he gets a a run. But um, you know, I'm sure, sure Dylan will talk about the. New Zealand B team, and we've just got to remember, no Williamson, Southie, Mitchell, Santner, Phillips, Conway, no Bolt, Bracewell, Henry, Ferguson, Nisham, or your mate Ben Lister, and Henry Shipley's out as well. So there's literally 13 guys in the squad, including the three newbies that I mentioned, but there's actually 13 guys completely unavailable. So it really is a, a second-string team. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like it, though. Now, just now get, correct me if I'm wrong. It was Josh Clarkson that played that magnificent innings and had that magnificent game in the final of the uh, Ford, Ford Trophy. trophy. Or, yeah. yeah, and that's when I, he first caught my eye. And from memory, he's a powerful striker of the ball uh, and a, a kind of handy, medium, medium, fast uh, bowler. Not not amazing um, stats in his first class career they're not amazing but they obviously see some potential in him Dylan yeah he's a clean striker of the ball I think um, the one and only Scotty J Stevenson described the sound of the super smash as being a six off the batter Josh Clarkson which is high <laughs> praise in, indeed um, look I'm a little troubled by this and look I'm a cricket tragic so I'm going to watch it yes it doesn't matter what you so, throw, throw well, I'll be up. commentating it as well it doesn't matter what you throw up there on screen I'm going to watch it but if you're a dad wanting to take your kid along to the opening game of the New Zealand International Summer and your kid's going, oh, great, we go and see Kane Williamson. Oh, no, nah, sorry, he's not there. Oh, see Timmy Sally. Ah, oh, no, nah, he's not there, actually. Trent Bolt, nope. You keep going down the list. I, I just think there's better ways you can do this. And I know it's just bilateral churn um, for basically to give content to broadcasters that you can sell to your sponsors and that. But just having such a big block of players out all at one go, not even filtering in and out, just tells me that this cricket means bugger all to anybody. And why would, why if you're a casual supporter, not me, not you, why if you're a casual supporter would you engage in that? Mm, mm. Well, Jeff writes, I was having a cheeky look at the ICC player rankings to see if Glenn Phillips featured on the test or rounder list. He doesn't. When I noticed Kane is ranked number one test batter, I thought it was worth mentioning. Curious to hear how you think the Black Caps B team should line up against the Bangers on Sunday. I assume Phineas Slog and Ratchin will open. Josh Clarkson plays the other all rounder, and Milne and Jamison will lead the attack. My questions Should Chapman come in at number six to up the scoring or try him at first drop? Any chance Latham will give up the gloves to Blundell? Surely they're going to play Ish the Dish in game one, Ashok in games two and three, Paul Ford. Answer all of those, would you please? Yeah. In the space I, of two I, minutes. I have made my 11, yeah, and I think, um, who was it? Jeff. I think Jeff uh, is pretty pretty much on the money here. I mean, I suspect it's going to be Allen and Ravindra to open up. I think it'll be young. I don't think that uh, Blunder will take the gloves. I think he'll be 
left out and Latham will captain and wicket keep, then I think it'll be Nips and I think it'll be Mark Chapman. I think they'll give Josh Clarkson a run and then it'll be Jamison, Sodi, Sodi slash Ashok, um, Ashok and then uh, Milne and Duffy as the as the main seamers and uh, maybe Will Rock coming and going a little bit over the three matches. So, yeah, I mean, did I answer all of those questions? What's the I, point I think, in Blunder? What's the yeah, point in that selection? I, I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure either. Maybe do you, do you think there's maybe something going on that Latham said? Oh, look, a bit along the lines of those guys being rested. Um, can I play? Can I be captain? But I don't want to be the wicket keeper, or you know, yeah, just that, to take a little bit of pressure off. I'm yes, not sure. and and maybe just his form, you know, has not been great, Latham, and they've gone, you know, but got if to have they're an going option. full development eleven, pretty much, and yet they've got these two hyper experienced um, wicket keepers, one who's not really seen as a white ball cricketer at all if you're going to go development 11 why why isn't tim seifert there why isn't dane cleaver who i guess is maybe a bit old it's a good now. call um, sure. yeah absolutely i think that's really fair questions um actually now uh of course the first game this sunday fellas uh the acc will be commentating that i can't where is it mclean park dunedin i oh, know dunedin dunedin, dunedin. dunedin. Then oh good Nelson, then napier yeah, so they'll be freezing their asses off down there. But I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break here and then get into a bit of IPL chat. Well, welcome back uh, to the BYC. Uh, the IPL auction next Tuesday in the slave auction are uh, Ratchin, Ravindra, Daryl Mitchell, Lockie Ferguson, Ish, Sodi, Finn Allen, uh, Mark Chapman, Colin Munro, Michael Bracewell, James Neesham, Matt Henry, Kyle Jamison, Adam Milne, Tim Southey, Willow Rock retained uh, Kane Williamson, the Gujarat Titans, and uh, Trent Bolt, the Rajasthan Royals. I'm thinking, well, who are your lock-ins apart from the retained ones there? I think, um, I think Ratchin will make a bit of money. I, I believe Ratchin too will make a bit of money, no question about it. But any other dead sets for you? I'd be amazed if Daryl Mitchell's not picked up for his reserve price. Yes. I'd be amazed by that. I think Lockie's going to struggle, you know. It's been a couple of years of ordinary form. I don't think Isha's got much chance. Van Allen didn't get a single game uh, when he was signed last year, so he's probably struggling. Yeah, Colin Munro's time's probably passed. I'm, yeah, I think there's really only two two locks there. I, I, I agree with you entirely. I think Ratch and Ravindra, um, Paul Ford, Daryl Mitchell certainly will be have very good prospects. Even the likes of someone like a Kyle Jamison hasn't played enough cricket, I don't think, to probably warrant selection. Uh, anyone else other than those two that you're looking at that you think, yeah, they got a good shot? No, I, no, I think I think you guys have, have have nailed it. I mean, there's sort of injury clouds hanging over a fair few of these blokes. They've either just come back from injury or they are currently unavailable because of injury. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm intrigued about what happens with someone like Munro. I mean, if he keeps scoring 99 not outs in the big bash and so on, then uh, you know, worth a shot, right? He's not going to be going for heaps. Why, why not chuck him a throw, throw the dog a bone, as they say? But um, yeah, look, I think the two that you mentioned feel pretty solid. It's amazing how much money is sloshing around over there. In the women's um, Premier League auction last week, you had uh, Annabelle Sutherland, whose old man used to be the head of Cricket Australia. She got she got picked up for four hundred grand New Zealand and a um, Phoebe Litchfield, who's sort of a fringe Australian player. She went for two hundred grand. I mean, it's incredible how much money's going around. But we've got to remember in this in this men's version, there's guys like Travis Head, Mitchell Stark, um, Harry Brook, Pat Cummins. I mean, th there's a lot of there's a lot of money to be spent on some big guns. Um, that, uh, that some of our guys look at look look a little bit uh, below par in the, against some of those bigger names. Yeah, well, as, as stated, I think those two are good chances. Uh, the rest it will be a surprise uh, to me. Uh, speaking of the women's game, the White Ferns uh, finding a little bit of form. Dylan Cleaver, after you absolutely hoed into them in the last podcast, yeah, well, they were really rubbish. got the knives out and uh, <laughs> really put your your reputation on the line there, and just didn't spare the horses. Didn't spare the horses. I haven't heard that one for a while, but I, I tell you what, they were rubbish in that T Twenty series, and they, they were. They deserved a bit of a, a tickle up. Um, I didn't even bother with the dead rubber T20i, which they won. I think it was Rain Short and won, and Susie Bates got them home yes. relatively comfortably. And uh, she went back to the well in the first ODI, 
and scored big runs. And uh, the White Ferns did what we wanted them to do in the T20s, which was actually bat with some intent. Genuine Genuine urgency, yes, and intent, and uh, Bates. Yeah, well, you know, she's an all-time great for the White Ferns. Scored a century. Um, Bazudenheit, who, speaking of not spreading the horses, who Paul had an absolute crack at last week. Oh, yeah, that was a shocker. <laughs> she came, she came good with eighty odd. So, um, more of it. Inspirational please. feedback. That's what I'm calling it. Well, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, obviously, you guys just you know, really hoeing in there has provided a little bit of, you know, impetus for them, you know, giving them a kick up the bum, as they say. I mean, you were shocking last week too, Paul. You were t- I was shocked. I mean, I know, it really breaks bro- broke your heart as such an enormous white fern supporter, Jason. Totally, I man. I know how you just take that stuff to heart. You know, it was a one, one, couple of quick observations. One is, in that third game, the dead rubber, Amelia Kerr was the uh, captain and... I mentioned last week there was this lack of joy. They were the fielding was massively improved in that in that third game, and they went mad when they got wickets. So that was good. That was really good. And uh, the the thing in this first one day was there were some hectic injuries. Uh, one of the Pakistani bowlers got a I think it was a Sophie Divine drive to the face. You had Amelia Kerr getting hit in the back of the head and collapsing onto the ground when she was batting. Um, it was it was mad. And yeah, as you say, Sophie Divine back from her rest. In, in the third T20 and batted like she was had forgotten that it was a one day and hit 70 off 36 balls with six sixes, mostly full toss pull shots onto the runway at the Queenstown Airport. Absolutely wonderful. Great stuff. Now, an in international news, Australia versus Pakistan. Uh, test match starts tomorrow at 3.20pm in Perth. Uh, I love a Perth test. Yes. It's good, isn't it? It just slots into my time zone perfectly. Yeah. I, I, you know, as much as I despise them. the Australians, I, I do love watching the Aussies at home and playing Test cricket. Yeah, it's good stuff. It's always good cricket, isn't it? Yes. You know you're not going to get a wicket like you got at Murpur. No, Murpur. Um, Murpur. <laughs> yeah, I'm expecting. Is this a mismatch? Is this is this Australia versus Pakistan game a mismatch? It's, it's, yeah, well, I was total. about to ask you, Dylan. Actually, is this going to be an absolute trouncing? Total. Uh, Pakistan are going to rely very, very heavily on runs from Baba Azam, who didn't have a great World Cup. They're going to rely very, very heavily on wickets from Shaheen Shahi Freddy, who I assume is available. Yes. Um, but uh, my feeling is that Australia, they're on a high, right? World Cup winners, World T20 champions, World totally. Test, Test champions. Um, oh, sorry, they're not the World T20. 20 champions, but they're in a good space. Pat Cummins is in a good space. He's won back the Australian public. The most interesting thing about this test in terms of result is the sort of re, uh, reception that Davy Dum Dum is going to get from the Perth crowd. He's, whether he likes it or not, he's seen as a principal agitator in getting favourite son, Justin Langer, yes. out of that job. And he has also um, raised the ire of Mitchell Johnson, which we discussed last week. So on this farewell tour of his, it might get off to a, a somewhat rocky start in the um, yeah. Sandgrope estate. We, you, know, you, you make a good point, though, Dylan. I mean, Australian cricket really on a high. And it's been a while since they've been at home, eh? I mean, they haven't actually been able to play at home for quite some time. My recollection, Paul Ford, was the last time uh, Pakistan toured there, they got an absolute hiding. Oh, I've got an absolute... I've got a couple of stats for you, Jace. 25 years... Pakistan have been going to Australia. They've played uh, five series, five series, fourteen test matches. They've been, uh, they've lost every single one of those test matches. Four of them by an innings, four of them by more than one hundred and seventy runs, and three of them by nine or ten wickets. I mean, they don't normally lose. They get absolutely annihilated. They don't have Nasim Shah, who's one of their strike bowlers. Harris Ralph said, "Hey, thanks for picking me, but I'm going to go play the Big Bash. Thanks." And then in the warm-up game against the Prime Minister's eleven, their main leg spinner, Abram Ahmed, got injured. So they are in, I mean, they are massively on the back foot. There's some interesting stats. Um, Shane Shah Freedy, who you just mentioned, um, Manas Labashane does not like facing his late and swinging Yorkers and has got out to him, I think, five or six times. Um, and I saw Muhammad Hafiz has come out and said that they're going to try and smash Lion out of the attack. So that should be good to watch. Bold, bold um, strategy. 
bold strategy. The other thing I was going to just throw at you, Dylan, when you were rattling off um, some excellent reasons why the uh, Western Australian public should hate um, David Warner just a little bit more than than the rest of Australia. The other one is that if if the selectors pick Cam Green, it means that Mitchell Marsh will be the guy left out um, because David Warner is on his victory lap. And yeah. so uh, there's another reason. Uh, oh. Their boy, Mitchell Marsh, may not be in the 11 unless they pick him ahead of Cam Green. One other reason too is that um, everyone has had a chance to redeem themselves from Sandpaper Gate except for Cam Bancroft. Where's he from? Perth. WA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey, there's actually a K. Uh, sorry, I was going to say a KFC, a TAB. Good punt. Um, which uh, G Lane, the brain, the great brain, the interesting brain of G Lane, that's put on has put on. Uh, he's bet it on Usman Kawaja to be the top run scorer in the first innings, and that's paying four dollars fifty ahead of the likes of Steve Smith three seventy five and Manus paying four bucks. Uh, what do you think of G Lane's bet, boys? Well, yeah. I reckon Steve Smith's hungry. I was reading somewhere that he's very, very hungry. So, uh, well, the fact that Dylan's backing him to the hilt—that's a definite fail, obviously. I just, I, I think that it's not Smith, or Shane, or Warner. I don't really care. I really hope it's Kawaja. Uh, it would be lovely, but uh, yeah, we like Kawaja, don't yeah. we? And he's, uh, he's beautiful to watch. He is abs- quite genuine. Genuinely, he is. Remember watching him live at Eden Park, and he is something to behold live. Now the big bash. Uh, Colin Munro, the eternal question. Not a question as far as I'm concerned, but one of you thinks it is. Uh, did New Zealand ditch him too early? Well, when you say it's not a question, you obviously have the answer. No, not at all. I, I don't know. I no. wouldn't have him on my side. I reckon they did I ditch pers- him too I early. I have personal reasons for that, though. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But um, feisty, feisty character. Umpiring reasons. No, I just think, um, you know, better options. But, yeah, he's got ability, sure. I think they did for T20s. I hope I don't meet him on the street after saying that. You probably will, and you know he's going to go you. Actually, I think he should be in the side. <laughs> no, I, Bring I, him back. It's, I mean, he's a good T20 player, really good T20 player. 99 not out the other night. I think he got 40-something last night on a really tricky wicket at Manuka Oval. You know, we haven't, we're not that blessed with talent that we can pretty much blanket someone out like they did with Colin Munro when he still had clearly plenty to offer. There might be other reasons for it. Though. Yes, and, and I was going to say, sorry, Paul. Um, yeah, and, and I was being a bit facetious there. I, I, he is a good player in T20s. There's no question about it. And I look at Phineas Slog and so forth and I go, He's a well, player yeah, Phineas yeah. Slog. And so in, actually, in actual fact, it is a fair question. But it, it does raise the question, are, we, are there things going on there other than cricket. Well, it does seem like that. And, you know, it's never been really, really spelled out for us. And I do wonder when, whether a guy of his uh, vintage now, who is going in and out of lots of team environments, I wonder whether his approach to joining a dressing, dressing room has changed. Because it does seem like if you were a bit of a, if you were a hard work in that situation, why would you keep getting picked up by franchise after franchise after franchise? And, um, you know, it's probably too late now, but I do wonder whether he's been kind of um, d- deemed to be something that he that he no longer is. Yeah. Yep. Well, in fact, I think he it almost looked like he makes a real effort to be a team man now. He mentioned it when he got that 99 not out coming off the pitch the other day. The commentator said to him, you know, it was a softball question. Oh, you must be disappointed he couldn't get on strike for the last three balls. He was just like, nah, nah, you know, anyone that knows me will know that I'm a great team man and the guy at the other end hit three fours. That's far more important than me getting a one for a hundred. And he's always first one up to slap people on the back. When Nessa, I don't know if you saw it last night, Michael Nessa, if you get a chance, go and watch that catch on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, my it, goodness. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Yeah. And Colin Munro is like running from other side of the field to slap people on the back. He's wearing his cap for the highest run scorer. So, yeah, I think Paul raises the valid point, and I think he's probably bang on the money. Yeah, interesting. Corey Anderson, Paul. Yeah, interesting. 17 and 2 for 10 on debut. I mean, it was a, he was thrown out there. I'm not saying he's never been in that situation before, but it wasn't really a situation where he could go full Corey Anderson. Um, I did have a look. Goodness me, it's amazing that he's turning up playing in the Big Bash. His last start was playing for the Mor- the Morrisville Unity 
in a 10 over shenanigans tournament um, which was in the US. It's US Masters T10. Um, he's 33 years old. What the hell is he doing playing Masters cricket? Anyway, I think, uh, I, I just really hope, it's lovely to see him back out there. He's a bloody good player on his day. And I just hope we see him going absolutely hell for leather against some of those middle of the road Australian bowlers at some point very soon. Yeah, because what, what really happened with him? Because he was a, a real pros, you know, a, a shining star there for a while. Was it injury? Kept breaking down. Yeah, it? yeah. So he could only play as a batter, and it wasn't quite good enough to carry his place as a batter. As, as a batsman, yeah, yeah. Good point. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to take uh, another break. And when we uh, come back, we'll discuss England losing to the Windies. Uh, welcome back to the BYC. England, of course, lose to the West Indies, Paul Ford, and the unravelling continues. God, they've been atrocious. <laughs> Yeah, when you're losing to a team that didn't even qualify for the Cricket World well, Cup yeah. um, and who you haven't had any success against since 2007, uh, pretty extraordinary. Their first, this is the West Indies, we should give credit to them, they did some good things. Some of their guys look dangerously unfit, but they can belt a ball. Um, they, this is their first win in a bilateral series against a full member nation for more than two years. Um, horrendous game, this uh, one. Rain affected and late starts and it kind of got dragged around. But, yeah, absolutely. England were uh, absolutely buggered pretty early doors. They were 49 for five. And uh, dog's breakfast they are, England. Shambles. Yeah. What, what, what the bloody hell is going on there, Dylan Cleaver, with England? Well, I can tell you what's going on right at the moment as we're speaking is that they are defending 171 on the first T20. West Indies are en route. 123 for four, but it's a pretty stiff chase. Uh, just, yeah, the, the white ball the white ball scene in England seems in a completely different place yeah. to the red ball. Well, I know that's a trite thing to say, but it feels like everything is heading in the right direction with the red ball. Everyone's gung-ho. Everyone knows how they want to play. They just look a bit confused. Well, they certainly did in India during the World Cup. Yes. It was like they were caught between two stools of how they wanted to play and neither was working. Yeah, it's it's bizarre stuff. Now, this is a good story. Um, Lou Vincent back from the outer reaches of the uh, Cricket Galaxy fellas. Yeah, great. Um, and I, I think that's terrific news, genuinely, and I always think that he was pretty hard done by to be so... I mean, he... he did a stupid thing. He, of course, he did a stupid thing, and and acknowledged it and came forward about it. But I always felt Paul Ford, the punishment was pretty brutal. Yeah, I, I agree. Eleven life bans or, or whatever it was, and you know he owned up to it. He did pretty much everything you could possibly do when you've done something terrible like that to to affect the integrity of the game, and and he still got absolutely thumped. It was eighteen breaches, I think, of the. Of the code and um you know great that um new zealand cricket the ecb the icc i think uh the i understand um brendan mccullum's 2016 mcc spirit of cricket lecture where he talked about the lou vincent situation and uh you know uh, that that the, the said that he thought that lou deserved some sympathy and some clemency i guess and uh yeah look I, I don't know Lou particularly well, but I've had a few experiences when I worked at Auckland Cricket with him. He was one of the most enthusiastic people, absolutely loved the game, amazing with kids, always did every possible sponsorship obligation you could ask of him and was sort of first man there and last man to go. It was a, it's been really sad what's happened to him. And, you know, I know the authorities have to do what they do, but thank God that sanity's prevailed and, and that he'll be back out there. I think it'll be good for the game. Yeah, I mean, that's what we want, right? We want them teaching kids. We want them to, we actually want them travelling the country, telling how damaging it can be to hurt the game and to get yourself into a position like he did. So, yeah, look, it's not as if you're totally forgiving him for his crimes. I mean, he was punished. I don't know if he can take a full part in cricket now, but he's certainly, um, yeah, it's good to have him back. Yeah, well, uh, Demetrius uh, writes, uh, he along these lines, but he also says, what are your thoughts on a precedent for a relaxed punishment for those who show, who confess and show remorse slash contrition? It seemed up until now players were better served denying and suing anyone who, who accused them of fixing 
instead of cooperating and helping get corruption out of the game pull forward? Yeah, look, there's something, I think that there's something in this. I mean, there's an absolute host of, um, I guess, players that have been involved in this. And, and quite a few of these life bans have actually been overturned. Um, Salim Malik is one, uh, Atta Ur Rahman, Muhammad Azaruddin, um, RJ Sharma, uh, RJ, uh, RJ Jadeja. I mean, all of these guys have had life bans and they've all had them overturned. So, um, yeah, look. I don't know. It's hard to make a hard and fast rule here, but it does feel like, it, you know, as I said before, Lou had been treated particularly severely for what he did, particularly for a guy that has fronted up and and kind of taken all of the hits to his reputation and uh, and gone and done, you know, lots of work teaching other players about anti-corruption, you know, doing, doing the hard yards on that front too. Yeah, good stuff, mate. Now the Ford Trophy, um, ND atop the table there on 15, Auckland 12, CD 11, Otago 8, Canterbury 7, Wellington 7, uh, Phineas Slog 369, Bill Clark 193, Brett Hampton Downs 188, Adam Mill 9, Christian Clark. Oh, have you, you've done it again, haven't you, you sons mm-hmm. of bitches? <laughs> uh, Brett Downs, or is it Brett Hampton? How do you yeah. say hemp? It's so hard to say Hampton. Yep, you got it the third time. James yes. Uh, you know it when Milne, you said Hampton Downs. <laughs> um, Adam, Adam Mill, nine, Christian Clark, nine, and Ray Tool, nine. Is Ray Tool real? Yeah. <laughs> yes, actually. He's been, he's been playing bloody well for a number of years now, but the number that stands out there by a mile is uh, for Nell, for Nia Slug, 369, averaging 92. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all you need to say about the full trophy. You move on, shall yes. we? Speaking well, of I moving think on, it's about to it's about to finish, isn't it? Like, sorry, have a break. There's no then then there's none. I think there's a game today, Auckland versus Wellington, which was rain affected, but I think they're underway. And but then got then got canned. Um, and then there's no there's no more full trophy until February. Uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Nick Greenwood, of course, a Wellington player. He got 64 this week, but more importantly, plays for Jersey. So he's come from a a diet of playing teams like Canada, Denmark, Uganda, and the UAE. Amazing. Great stuff. Well, right now it's time for News or Ruse. Yeah, it is. And I accidentally ended up with the trophy again last week, didn't I? Is that, is that what happened? Yeah. Three, week, three weeks you've had it now. Jeremy Wells um, and I worked together, co- collaborated on, on last week. Uh, there'll be something wrong with uh, these next three pieces of news, and you guys need to tell me what it is. Um, I did just want to shout out, I mean, we talk about the Oi Hoi Trophy, which is a terrible trophy um, named after some chip packets um, in Pakistan. And I was walking after a few beers with Dylan Cleaver last Friday. A few. In the evening, 17. Um, I was walking up the top of Queen Street. There's a restaurant on Queen Street called Oi Hoi, and the catch line is always high on food. So I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying that it exists. Uh, yeah, anyway. you got a picture there too. It's an absolute doozy. Yeah, it's like your sort of joint DC. Yeah, well, I'm I'm certainly going to go and have a look. <laughs> Good on you, mate. Yeah. All right. Uh, first one to inject more discipline into the game. The ICC has announced the introduction of the stop clock rule, which the stop has what? Stop clock rule. Thank you. Which has come into effect starting with today's first T20 that we were just talking about between the England and the West Indies. This is designed to ensure a match is completed within a time limit, reducing the room for wastage of time. After each over, an electronic clock displays on the big screen with a 60-second countdown, and the fielding side must begin the next over within this time frame or face consequences, i.e. a maximum of two warnings, and then the third offence will result in a five-run penalty. There's exceptions for stuff like batters taking position at the crease, drinks intervals, injuries, bats breaking, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, something to, to keep an eye out for, I guess, over the over the uh, rest of the season. Uh, number two, trouble has erupted in South Africa with David Tabruga, the 18-year-old captain of the country's under-19 and under-19 team and head boy of the prestigious multi-ethnic school King Edward High, who dedicated a Jewish Rising Star Sporting Award, I mean, how could this go wrong, to the Israeli soldiers presently engaged in the battle against Hamas in Gaza. The 18-year-old said, I'm the rising star, but the true rising stars are the young soldiers of Israel. Uh, The Cricket South Africa promptly suspended him and launched an inquiry 
They found uh, that the teenager's remarks were in his personal capacity and unrelated to cricket, and thus it was not detrimental to the sport. The Jewish community were completely appalled that South Africa, Cricket South Africa even dared to launch proceedings and had a great quote and said, Cricket South Africa should be ashamed of itself, subjecting a young schoolboy to a Maoist inquisition to test his ideological purity. Lofty stuff in uh, South Africa. Uh, and number three, New Zealand Cricket has confirmed, bless them, that the day three, the Saturday of the first test between the Black Cats and Australia at Wellington's Basin Reserve on March the 2nd, has sold out. And less than 10% of tickets are available for the rest of the days of the test match. All four days of the test at the 6,400 capacity basin are on track and it'll be sold out by Christmas. 500 travelling Australian fans will be there. And of course, let's not forget the Black Caps are on a five test winning streak there after wins over England and Sri Lanka this year. There we go, boys. What do you, re- what do you reckon? Clocks. Um... Do you want me Gaza. to go? Yeah, well, I don't, well, I don't in the know. basin. I haven't got, um, I haven't I th- got a clue. I think it's number three, and I think it's already sold out. Okay. Um, I think David Tabruga used to be a medium pacer for South Africa years ago, but I guess there's a chance that there's more than one David Tabruga in the world. I'll go for the story too, but I've got zero reason why I'll, maybe Tabruga was not subject to a Maoist Inquisition, but rather a Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> I can't believe how you've just so lackadaisically just absolutely nailed it. Yes, David Tabruga. This guy's name is not David Tabruga, it is David Tiger. David Tabruga was the seven-test wonder who retired age 29, and he was famously the guy abused by G Lane at Eden Park in the one and only time that some idiot marketing manager at Auckland Cricket <laughs> gave G Lane the ground announcement gig during a test match between New Zealand and South Africa. They both so should have lost their in, jobs. You are 100% correct. Okay. Now we're moving on to my favourite. Yes. Slot Dylan slot. Cleavers, who am I? Thank you very much for that. That's a brilliant little lead. And just before I get into today's Who Am I, correspondence from Scott E. of Canada. Just got home from a long drive listening to the BYC podcast. I love how it feels like a group I could sit around a pub debating how shit Nichols is trying to loft over mid on when you've been not good for six years. Uh, please tell me the Who Am I is Mark Priest, Popeye. And you are absolutely correct. Last week's Who Am I was indeed Mark Priest. I thought the defrocked. Yes, gave it, it was away. a very good clue. Yeah, it I was. Know. It was a really good stupid clue. of Paul not to get that. Yeah. So this week's uh, Who Am I? You're going to have to go back a little bit further in time oh, God. than Mark oh, Priest, but I think you'll get it. Uh, okay. I played 13 tests for New Zealand across an eight-year span. I am neither a modern player, but nor do I belong only to the dusty recesses of time. In other words, the last time I checked, I am still alive. I was a schoolboy star and might, impl- and might have played in the most stacked first 11 of all time, alongside future New Zealand captains Mark Burgess and Hedley Howarth and 20 test all-rounder Ross Morgan. Like a wannabe cocaine cowboy, I made one big score on the South American mainland. It was a good bit of business, which is the world in which I really made my mark. In fact, when it came to business, you could say that the sky was the limit. Who am I? Oh, I can I can see my. I know this is not working on a podcast, but I can see mine's cogitating here. Yeah. Um. You didn't Does get... it rhyme with um, Mary Tardis? Oh, genius. Genius. Well done, mate. Well done. Well, uh, if Harry anyone Jarvis. else out there knows the name. <laughs> Do you? Oh. Correspond- oh, yeah. I don't want to ruin it, though, <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> anyway, we'll ruin it for all the punters out there. Come on, mate. Jeez <laughs> Louise. Uh, but do get in contact with us and let us know if you have the answer to that. And right now it's time for Paul Ford's Cricket Violence Corner. Paul Ford's Cricket Violence Corner. In a shocking incident, a school principal has been videoed thrashing two teenage students with a bat for playing cricket inside their classroom in Ujjain on Friday. 
the incident occurred at the Kida Kajaria School, where the students can be seen playing cricket in their classroom. Angry, the principal snatches their bat and starts thrashing the duo. A video recorded from outside the window of the classroom brilliantly captures the moment of the assault. Wait for this. The Education Department has stated that an investigation into the conduct of Principal Uday Singh Chauhan will be conducted. Chauhan claims the video is several months old. That's not a great defence. <laughs> and that the students were being beaten because they were mischievous and had caused disruption in the past. Also not a great defence. And then the uh, absolute doozy of a finish. He said he wasn't beating them forcefully, but rather only whacking them to try and instill fear. Um, I think this guy might need a bit of help with his uh, defence. What anyway, shadow batting shot was he playing? Uh, it was a very, very... Uh, I would say it was a, a, it was a pull shot very Oof. very square to through square leg yeah Jeez he's wearing Louise. one of those um he's wearing brown slacks and one of those absolute archetypal indian cricket watching shirts with the uh, sort of three different um vertical brown stripes and sensible buttons and a good collar on it so yeah great absolutely. stuff great, great, great stuff, stuff. Before. well that brings us to the end of the podcast now i'm not sure when the podcast is back fellas have we determined that good question um, Have we got one more on us before Christmas? What's this no, one? I'm I'm away, mate. Well, I mean, you two could. Good yeah. point. Yeah, look, I, I'm, I've got a holiday plan, but I'm happy to cancel it because I'm committed to this podcast and I'll be here next Wednesday. Fool. Um, <laughs> no, that's fair enough, Paul Ford, if you want to do that. Uh, mind you, you were saying you weren't really keen on the holiday and the place you were going to and any chance to get out of it, you'd, you'd, you'd snap up. So good on you, mate. Hey, uh, Dylan, what's going on with the bounce, mate? The bounce is tracking along as well. It's, it's deciding whether it's going to have a Christmas holiday or not. And at the moment, it's leaning towards not. Right, so sure. So sign up, dylancleaver.substack.com, and uh, you'll get a sports newsletter dropped into your inbox three times a week, maybe drop down to two at this time of year. Sure, sure. Uh, well, thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you want to get in touch with us, because we do appreciate your correspondence, what do they need to do, Paul? Like us, your missive of 150 words or thereabouts to byc at beigebrigade.co.nz or slide into the DMs for the Beige Brigade or the Alternative Commentary Collective on Instagram or Facebook. Great stuff. Take care out there. Have a great Christmas and hopefully see you soon.